Welcome to the ISO Show, dispelling myths and sharing tips for success to improve your business with ISO standards with your host, Mel Blackmore. Hello and welcome to the ISO Show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Well, my guest today is a person who is setting the standard in retail sustainability. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the show Adam Hamilton Fletcher, who's the founder and managing director of Design Conformity. Welcome, Adam. Hi. Great. Thanks very much for joining us today. So I'm really intrigued by this subject because obviously in the past we've talked about sustainability standards for businesses. And we're going to be talking today about setting these standards, uh, which is really exciting for products. In particular, it's in relation to the furniture industry, isn't it? And uh, the work that you've been doing in retail as well. Yes, we are are an independent design standard. So design conformity is an independent design standard that was created for retail furniture manufacturers originally. But we've been expanding outside of retail into office furniture, hospitality furniture, healthcare, that kind of thing. Great. So could you tell me a little bit more about design conformity and what you do and what inspired you to create it? Yeah, sure. So so my background, I worked in the manufacturing industry for about 15 years, designing lighting systems for major retailers, people like Boots, Next, Marks and Spencers, Morrisons. In particular, the lighting that went into the displays. And as a salesman, I was out there pitching my my very expensive product. And it was expensive because it was it was very, very good at reducing energy. So I had to create a business case for my product. And that meant developing a specification, understanding the customer's requirements, and then developing a solution that met those requirements. There's no standards in the retail display industry. There is some small standards in America, but but in the UK and Europe, we don't have standards. So born out of that desire to understand the customer's requirements, develop a solution that meets that requirement, we created Design Conformity. And over the last five years, we've grown from what started as an electrical and lighting standard into a full carbon certification company. Exciting. So I know that your goal is to become the gold standard for sustainable furniture design through your suite of products and your life cycle assessment certification process. I think just kind of digging into circular design, because obviously that's at the heart of what you do. What is circular design? If you could share that with our listeners and how does it help companies to reduce their carbon? Circular design is born out of this this principle of of a circular economy. A linear economy is when we take a raw material, we use it, we process it, and it's disposed of. It goes to landfill or something like that. A circular economy is where we take that waste product and we design it and use it into a new product uh, that can be repurposed and refreshed and, and reused. And then eventually those materials can be recycled. So the goal is to, to, to not use raw materials at any point. And, and, and that happens in stages, that's, that's the aspiration. So circular design is the intent to minimize environmental impact, to design equipment that could be reused, repurposed, and then at the end of its life, recycled. Okay, great, thank you. And um, could you give me some examples of what you actually do then? Yes, yeah, certainly. So while you guys work very, very well in company level analysis, reporting and and implementation of standards, what we do is look at within the company, within the design team, and we do something very similar. So we look at the way that companies design their furniture, and then we take them through a learning process through, we have an online guide, we have a design course that we take them through to help them to understand how to design that product in such a way that it can be repurposed or reused where the amount of materials used in it can be reduced where the shipping requirements could be reduced a typical thing would be to to source locally 
knockdown fashion, or they call it KD fashion. So you design the furniture so that it could be flat packed, shipped, and then built as required. So we look at that, that whole design process. We look at the way products are maintained. We look at the materials they're made from, and then we advise on better materials. And we have an online carbon calculator, which allows companies to select different materials. They can see the environmental impact of those materials. So for example, what's the difference between a Corian kitchen worktop and a marble worktop? What difference that would make between selecting those two materials? And we call that reduce, so that's sort of the second element of what we do. And then the third element is report. And we follow ISO standards, ISO 144, to provide a product evaluation. So that's a cradle to cradle life cycle assessment of the product. And that allows us to understand the carbon footprint of, the, of that product. While you guys look at companies, we look at product, but at the same time, the more that we look at products and the way that somebody manufactures, we actually cross over. And if you're using less materials, if you're repurposing more equipment, you're having you're reducing the company's environmental impact as well. So there's a, there's a synergy between company level reporting and, and refinement, if you like, and product design and product refinement. You mentioned about the carbon efficiency calculator there's the estimator i believe that you're offering a free seven-day trial it's detailed on your website <laughs> uh, so i just thought to bring that bit to the attention of our iso show listeners that might be interested in trialing that how would our iso show listeners get access to that then do you mind just sharing your contact details of the the website and you know if they've got any inquiries about it yes thank you thank, thank you for highlighting that <laughs> We've not so long ago launched a online carbon calculator specifically for designers at a website called carbonefficiencyrating.com. Brilliant. And people can log in and uh, create an account and get seven days free access. What we tend to find is that the best way to understand how to use products and how to understand how to evaluate is in application. And we find that people who are working on specific projects, it might be a tender, for example, where um, a supplier has said to them, you need to report scope three carbon emissions of your products. And then we allow them that opportunity to go on to benchmark, create a carbon footprint estimate, and then they can use that to report in their tender and they can benchmark themselves. So we look at about 12 different, it's growing all the time, but about 12 different furniture types. And we've assessed around 14, between 1400 and 1500 different product designs. So by selecting a product of a particular type, they can go onto the estimator, enter the details of where they're manufacturing, what they're manufacturing up with, and then it will give them a carbon footprint. And then they can compare that against other industry designers. It doesn't name those designs, by the way. It's just an average, but it allows them to see whether they're above or below the industry average. It sounds as though that's a great place to start. You know, if an organisation doesn't have a clue about how sustainable their products are, it's a brilliant way to, to get started on that journey, isn't it, on that pathway? You're absolutely right. It's very difficult to, to set out a, a set of principles or implement a set of principles unless you understand where you're at in the beginning. We've recently implemented this for Costa Coffee. They are looking to reduce the environmental impact of their, of their shops, their coffee lounges. And the beginning of that process is to work with their manufacturers to identify the environmental impact, the carbon footprint of the furniture that they've got. And we look to do that as quickly and cost effectively as possible. It's free to subscribers, so that's quite, that's quite cost effective. But what it does is it helps create a benchmark and it helps people understand where the key indicators are to help them reduce that carbon footprint. Right. So ultimately, this is heading towards certification then, I guess, isn't it? In terms of having like, a, you know, if you're going into John Lewis to buy a washing machine and there's a information on the efficiency, energy efficiency rating on that, then you're basically applying something similar from a, a carbon perspective on furniture products. That's right. 
we've plagiarized the EPC, if you like, the Energy Performance Certificate. So it's very recognizable to consumers. Uh, we have a, a carbon efficiency index, if you like, from C1 to C7, which listeners would be familiar with. It, it's very, very, it looks like you would, as you say, you'd see on an energy certificate. But what it measures is the total carbon footprint divided by its size, divided by its life, because when you design something in a more circular fashion, you're extending its life. If you are designing it in a circular fashion, you're reducing the weight of materials and therefore the density of carbon within a square meterage, for example. So we, we score things by carbon efficiency and by processing that, if you like, that's through our software, we're able to produce a certificate. And then at the end of that certificate, we have an eco label and our ambition is to become a, a highly sought after and aspirational eco label, not too dissimilar to British standards. So if you can imagine the British standards is, is a quality design mark, we are a quality and sustainability design mark. Right. So in terms of the circular design certificate, it sounds as though this is definitely the way forward. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, while we haven't had it in the past, obviously it's great that Design Conformity have created this and, and hopefully this podcast will bring awareness to our audience and that the fact that uh, this is an opportunity if they're looking at demonstrating credibility by using an independent design standard for those products. So I was just wondering, what would you say the benefits of, of uh, circular design certification? I, th I think there's a, there's a careful balance between reportings and ratings. And we sit on this kind of balance between carbon reporting and carbon rating. As you well know from past 2060 and, and, and ISO standards, there's an awful lot of data gathering, collation and process management to reducing carbon. And that sometimes can get lost in its explanation to consumers or, or people who are buying or using the product. So. In the same way that we might look at it, we, we don't want to fall into this trap of being just a green label, you know, a green stamp of approval. Um, what we want to be is a balance between the environmental reporting, which falls under the scope three reporting requirements of boarding goods and services. So capturing that process of cradle to cradle analysis on, on carbon footprint, and then translating that into something that's easy to understand, recognizable, in a format that buyers and consumers can use and understand, and then presenting that in a certificate. And it's that constant monitoring and certifications, reporting your carbon footprint for the product, but aligning that to your long-term ambitions, your long-term goals of continuous improvement and constantly reducing down the carbon footprint. So for example, Costa Coffee, they wanted to reduce the environmental impact of their, of their stores. One example might be they would reduce products that go to the use of materials that go to landfill. That will reduce the carbon impact. They then might design more of their products for disassembly and refurbishment. They're working on an eco store at the moment where they're repurposing furniture that's come out of a store that's closed down. So rather than buying new products, they take back the old products, they refurbish them and they put those into the store. And it's that continuous improvement process, if you like, that adds weight and value to the certification. So you mentioned earlier about, you know, another green label, and obviously this isn't another green label, but there is quite a lot of scepticism out there about different labels that are coming out, whether it's for a business or, you know, it could be anything really. Do you think businesses are right to be skeptical about the value of the cost versus the value of environmental certification? A hundred percent. I think that we come from a manufacturing background, the team that we have, and we have an amazing team of specialists um, within the company, but all of them have been involved in, in manufacturing at one level. An eco label created by a marketing department and I don't want to be harsh on marketing departments, but a marketing-led eco-label is not necessarily going to require the, the level of interrogation that we would go into. It's, it's much more akin to PAS 2060 or ISO, 
So we look very, very in depth at the analysis. In the same way that an EPD does, an environmental product declaration or an LCA certificate from somebody like Cradle to Cradle, that's a highly valuable label, if you like, to work with. But unfortunately, there's an awful lot of unregulated greenwashing, they call it. But ultimately, where marketing departments or PR departments or people who aren't necessarily audited or held to account are taking ambitions and conveying those ambitions and intents without necessarily collating the data behind that to bring value and credibility to it. So I 100% think that it's a difficult market to determine credibility. There are over 600 different reporting mechanisms for ESG reporting, all of them requiring evidence. So it's no wonder that the that companies say, you know what, we're just going to find a way that, to make it look green. We're going to offset our carbon impact by planting lots and lots of trees, and that'll be great. That'll be good. So some may argue that this is an additional cost for retailers, for companies that are looking at uh, fitting out their offices. You know, do you see a time when sustainability will be both a financial and environmental benefit to an organisation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think if, if there was a way to do that, it's through circular design. So by way of example, if you're a manufacturing company that's producing shelving, you buy in steel to make your shelving and you have to buy that commodity in each time. And steel prices rise and fall and it's quite difficult. But you don't necessarily need to buy in steel. You could actually get your product, your original product back and reprocess your original product. Of course, companies are typically set up to manufacture and distribute. But if you reintroduce, they call it closed loop recycling, but if you reintroduce your product back into the manufacturing process, you wouldn't have to buy the materials. But what you're offering is an enhanced service. So I know certain retailers who would expect this of a, of a, of a supplier and then purchase the goods back at between 40 and 50% reduction. But if you look at the cost of buying the steel in, it actually makes it more profitable for the manufacturer to reuse materials. So I think it's still early days. I think you've got to be set up as a, as a company in a way to receive goods back. And I think that's a hindrance. I think collecting from store, shipping back to the factory, cleaning it all, processing. We're talking about very, very manual processes. And I think there's some obstacles to overcome in that sense. But once a company is set up in such a way as to receive product back, reintroduce it into the supply chain, there's an opportunity to improve margins. I think also sourcing locally reduced shipping costs in some respects. So I think in, in different ways, there are opportunities to make it pay for itself. That's going to happen over time. I don't think there's a quick win, but I think as companies design products that can be repurposed and establish ways to receive and reprocess them, so ultimately that will lead to profitability. There is another side to it, which is that increased share value. You know, better stories, better results go into ESG reports that drive investor demand. So there's that side of it, but I think it can be done at a more fundamental level. I think it can be done from a design point of view. And can you get talking about, I know you mentioned a couple of companies earlier, but could you give us some examples of, you know, the types of organisations or sectors who are really embracing circular design and succeeding? That's, that's a very good question. Uh, the, the first one that pops to mind is, is because we work in retail is, is Tesco's. So Tesco's have a policy whereby they will purchase in their metal shelving. They will use that for five years. It's then taken back out of store. It's powder coated, cleaned, and then reintroduced the store. Every time they do that, they're reducing the environmental impact of the carbon footprint of that shelving by 70%. Wow. So it's 70% less than buying a new set. And again, and again. And they can do that about five times. So it can make a big, big impact. Introducing where anything is electrified, you can get some quick wins. So, for example, 
the Boots Beauty Halls. They went through a program a couple of years ago of introducing lots of new exciting brands into the beauty halls. And they took the opportunity to introduce our certification. And we set standards for all the electrical energy consumption, if you like. And that's energy consumption can have a big, big impact because it goes into store for five years. And by working with about 45, 50 global brands, a lot of collaboration, mm. um, we were able to reduce the carbon footprint of the stores by about 39%. So there are, there are companies out there that are looking at this in a kind of a, a bigger, broader sense as a strategy and then finding ways to succeed. Right. Okay, it's great to hear those examples and those numbers as well. So it's already, I know it's still fairly early days, but it sounds as though you've made great progress in terms of transforming the retail industry already. So yeah, very best of luck. I wish you all, all the best with that, Adam. I think you're definitely on, on the right path. And well, I'm just, you know, delighted that we can share these stories with our ISO show listeners. So if there are any, you know, designers, architects, manufacturers and suppliers listening to this, and they'd like to find out about what you're doing and how they can start to get involved. Do you have any guides or information that you could share with our ISO show listeners? Absolutely. We've got the circular design guide aptly named, which is available on our website. So if they log into designconformity.com and they go to the product section, we have a guide there. And they'll be able to download the guide. It took a couple of years to write, and there was about 14 people involved in it. So it's a bit of a collaboration. It's, it's a little bit organic as well because we're constantly finding and updating. But that would be a great place to start. That would give them an overview. Yeah, sounds like a good read. I'm going to be downloading that to find out more about it. Well, it's been really enlightening speaking with you today, Adam. I'm absolutely delighted that you could spare the time to uh, share with us a bit more about design conformity, certification, the estimator that you've got online, the software that's available and the guide. So uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. So thank you very much. And thank you very much. I've been a listener for a while. So to be on this side of, uh, of the speakers is, is something special. Thank you very much indeed. Great, no problem. Well, we'll be including all of the links that Adam mentioned earlier in the podcast today. Uh, we'll be including all of that in the podcast show notes. So wherever you're listening to this, whether it's on iTunes or Spotify or even YouTube, you know, just click on the link and it'll go through to, to the various pieces of information that we talked about today. If you liked listening to the podcast today, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we'd love to get your comments. And if you can leave a review, that would be awesome because then this gets this podcast out to a wider audience. But yeah, thanks very much for joining us today. And I look forward to catching up with you on the next episode of the ISO Show. Looking to achieve certification to an ISO standard or just need a helping hand with ISO compliance? Contact us at blackmoresuk.com.